All right, hey, how you guys doing? I'm Billy Hoffman from Spy Dynamics. And I'm John Terrell from EM Technology. So John actually used to work at Spy before he left to join this really good startup, and uh, then Spy got bought by HP. But uh, back when John was still at Spy, we started talking about this. In fact, we've been talking about this stuff internally for about a year and a half, and it was kind of one of those things where it always interested us, but we never really had the time to do it. Um, and so we finally got around to it and decided to give the talk. So the, we're really trying to focus on hybrid webworms and what actually is going to happen in the face of web malware. Uh, the worms start off, uh, like what we've seen so far is self-propagating malware worms that exploit web app homes. Uh, like they hop domains, they go back and forth. It's very common in MySpace and, and things like that. Um, they're not really OS dependent, but sometimes are. Depending on whether yeah. they're uh, propagating through a cross-site scripting vulnerability, like say the SAMI worm, or say a command execution vuln like Perl.santi. It, it runs on the, on the web servers or the web browser. So you, you've got cross-site scripting, which is you know, the MySpace worm for, for SAMI, which just did client-side. Or you've got Perl.santi, which just did server-side. We've not seen it where it's combined to both, but the capability does exist. Right, and it spreads by really just requesting against the target vulnerable site. You know, if it's say, for example, Sammy, you know, you or a cross-site scripting based, you know, worm uh, like your manner or something like that. You uh, normally it's a stored cross-site scripting vulnerability, so that way other people come along and visit a profile and get owned. Um, sometimes it's command execution. Really, it depends on the type of worm, and your payloads can really be pretty much anything. Yeah. We've seen um, emails being stolen. We've seen you know, declarations of who your hero is, things like that. Uh, also, John and I tend to talk pretty quick. So if you've got a question or we're going too fast, just raise your hand or you know, feel free to interrupt us, because we'd rather you ask a question early on than get down the line. Um, so really, the problems with the webworms we're seeing now, if you want to foresee them as problems. And actually, this is a good idea, I guess, to go on this tangent. Yeah. John and I really debated whether we should even give this talk. Uh, because a lot of the stuff we're going to be talking about is going to talk about how to make things very, very bad. But John and I are also not really that smart of guys. So if we figure this out, you better believe somebody else already figured it out. Yeah. We've got a couple ideas about how to stop the stuff we're going to talk about. Uh, but we also realize we're not smart enough to fully develop the ideas. So we want to lay out there kind of what the current state of the web malware space is, talk about how um, the attackers are adapting to the defenses we have right now and try to have kind of a good public discussion about what we can actually do to defend this stuff. Yeah, we found that it's really, really easy to break stuff and not get caught. It's a lot harder to actually try and catch what we're doing. And we've got a couple of suggestions, but we're still finding ways that we can get past those. So right. this is kind of, it's the first step to people going, okay, we've not seen it yet, we will and we need to find a way to stop it before we start to see these in the wild. Exactly. So right now, the malware we're seeing, um, it doesn't, uh, until you start getting into things that are simply trying to drop browser exploits, um, WebSense and Finjin deal a lot with this type of stuff. Um, you know, spies coming at it from the, you've got vulnerabilities in your web app and that's how you're getting owned. They're coming at it from, the web is simply a vector to drop traditional exploits on the browser. Um, which window just gave a really good talk on how they're trying to stop that by having a secure browser. But there's basically no evasion right now. Um, most of the defense right now, it's just it's static code. They don't do any polymorphism. Um, they don't try to do any mutation of search strings. Uh, it's still pretty named stream. I mean, not, yeah. there aren't a ton of these things. Um, but that might change. Uh, network traffic is very distinctive. I mean, you can tell when um, MySpace or the, per the Sammy Worm has very distinct network profile of the, or the URLs it contacts, the order it contacts the URLs in, and in some case down to the, the uh, lag time between requests due to the processing. Granted, that varies from machine to machine, but the ratio is the same. But like when it spreads in more of like a random fashion where, it, where it's kind of like here and there and it, it jumps a lot, um, it, it's a lot harder to find, especially when you hide it in, in traffic that wouldn't be odd. For things that, you know, you're just viewing a page, you're viewing one page as opposed to you're viewing 30,000 pages, which you're going to see. So if you're jumping hosts and they're all viewing one or two pages, that's not going to look weird. Right. There's also these things kind of suffer, suffer from silver bullet fixes, right? I mean, Sammy existed because of particular cross-site scripting vulnerability. Yaminer existed because of cross-site scripting. You know, Sammy, I mean, all of these things go on. The, the quick time stuff that hit MySpace a little while ago, exploiting href track. 
Um, these things were silver bullet fixes. You applied the patch and you were done with it. Um, we're really looking at, well, how could you make something that you just don't patch something? It, it keeps going. Uh, also, the way it finds new hosts is signatureable. Um, the case in point was Perl.Santi. It used Google to find vulnerable hosts. It did a little Google dork trying to find, it was like PHP, yeah, PHPBB. Right. And so the way it selected hosts was really poor. It picked like a CC uh, TLD and then searched for PHPBB vulnerable sites in that domain. But the, it was a static search string. It was actually inside the Perl code. So as soon as somebody got a copy of the virus, which was all over the place, Google said, well, wait a minute. If that's the string they're searching on, if anyone ever searches for that, we'll just return an error page. So now, and the worm stopped. Yeah, now it's like you can go for PHP uh, BB version 7 or 7.0.1. And you can still find it, and it still goes through fine. But you know they're not going to catch it because it could be a valid search. And we'll talk a lot more about how to actually mutate search strings. But we're just trying to show kind of the, right now there are some deficiencies <laughs> from a black hat perspective in the type of malware we're seeing. Um, so John really came up with this, and we fleshed it out over, god, I guess a couple weeks, right? Yeah, well, it's been going on for about a year now. <laughs> but the, the, this was responsible for a lot of our light discussions. Yeah. Uh, so we really came up with this concept of a hybrid webworm to try to overcome a lot of these shortcomings. Uh, it would combine basically a server-side component and a client-side component. So it's not like SAMI, which just exploits the browsers, or it's not you know, like any like SQL Slammer, which just exploits servers. You know, it's going to do both. Uh, exploits, I mean, Yeah, XSS. that's going to run everything from client side to server side, back and forth. Uh, it, it's file inclusion, command execution, PHP includes. Um, it, it's stored at cross-site scripting, it's SQL injection, and it doesn't matter what's going to do the attacking. You can normally hit it from both server or client side, so it, it's going to get nasty. And this is why we said it also, it's kind of OS independent, right? If you're SQL injectable, or if you're cross-site scriptable, it doesn't matter what OS you're running, because I'm not really attacking the, the, bra the operating system, I'm attacking the browser. But if I'm doing, like, say, uh, there's a command injection vulnerability, if your web server is running on a Unix host or a Windows host, it actually matters. So, uh, and again, all of these are written in interpreted languages to try to make them as cross-platform as possible. So this is kind of how a hybrid worm works. It basically consists of two parts. Uh, a JavaScript component, or I guess you could do Flash, or God forbid, VBScript. <laughs> and uh, Perl or PHP or some server-side component. So that there's, let's say there's a site that's uh, infected.com and it has a piece of JavaScript in it. Uh, so when you visit the site, Alice, it gets downloaded to her machine, it's now running in her browser and can leverage Alice's credentials to get to other websites. Uh, it finds a file and we'll get into how it finds them, but it finds a, fi a um, uh, command injection vulnerability in site.com and it takes that Perl component of it, which right now is just sitting in a variable, a JavaScript variable, and injects it into the um, site.com and bringing along a little copy of the JavaScript. So the JavaScript's now inside the Perl component and you're in site.com. Now I've got command execution on the server. So I can, in this case, jump straight from site.com to other.com through possibly command injection vulnerability, however it hops. And then let's say other.com, they've got maybe IDS or firewall rules so that other.com, that web server, isn't able to get to other web servers. Well, in that case, the worm goes ahead and reverts back to its JavaScript form, simply writes itself out into the web root, into the HTML files in its JavaScript form again, and so it's able to get back out to people's machines and runs. Right, and uh, this can go back and forth, and it can say, send a, a, a small attack, and then go back and pull more code, or it can be one large chunk. And we, we actually found that the code for JavaScript and Perl and Tickle it, it, it's all scripted, and it, the structure is so similar that it, it's, it's a question of comment blocks to take out stuff that's just for that language. So you've got one, one big stretch that you can actually throw in there, and it works cross-language. Right. You actually could take a single block of code, and based on Perl, because both Perl and JavaScript have an eval statement to execute code that's stored in a string, and you use comments, right? Perl uses a different thing to denote comments, you know, the hash, than JavaScript. And so you, you put it in a try-catch, in JavaScript, and so if you give this code to a Perl interpreter, it runs the Perl code. You give the exact same code to a JavaScript interpreter, it runs the JavaScript version. So this flopping back and forth between the languages is relatively easy to do, and it also it drastically increases your pool of targets. And you've got that on size, too, because if you've got you know, eight different versions of the same worm, that's going to be a problem, especially if you've all got to sort in one spot. But if you can share the code, you can cut it down to be you know, the size of one and a half of, the, of, of one worm. 
Right. I mean, the, your code, a lot of your um, code syntax actually will work in one language and another. So you can actually share, you know, the same function that's used by Perl is also used by JavaScript. So it's also cross-domain, right? It, we, can, we have multiple methods of finding new domains to affect, which we'll jump into. Um, it's targeted propagation versus blind packet blast, like, say, uh, you know, MS Blaster or, you know, Hacked by Chinese version 4.5 or what have you. Um, so, you know, we can find specific hosts. We can target specific types of vulnerabilities because we're using a search engine to find these vulnerable sites. So we can say, hey, find me banks in the U.S. because that's who I want to own. That's who I want to infect. Or find me social networking sites in South America so that way I hit a large number of people on uh, with their browsers. Right, which now, it, it, like, we can do a targeting for client side and server side mm -hmm. where, where you can say, okay, you've got access to, you know, a, a 10 range or 192 or... Or, or like 172, you, you can also say this person has visited uh, a bank. Uh, that's a good point. Right. That, that you can say, okay, you've got you know, 10,000 people that have viewed this site. We've got the ability to infect or use them. We can now find, we can find it, it's more of like a needle in a haystack. Right. Um, and say that this person goes to this bank, this person goes to this bank. And, and we can just, just go at them and not blindly hit it from 10,000 people. We can also uh, make it targeted, right? There's a hack that got talked about here last year about how JavaScript can actually find out what sites you visited. Yeah. It uses a cascading style sheet trick to create a link and then check the color of the link to see whether you're visiting it. So when the worm's running on the browser, it can start saying, hey, what banks have they logged into? What banks have they visited? Maybe there's still cache session credentials. We can do a cross-site request forging tack and use their credentials to get into other sites. So really, by running both on the client and the server, you get something that's more than just the sum of its parts. The, the big thing that John and I are focusing on today that we're going to talk a lot about is ensuring maximum survivability of the worm. Uh, and remember, we got to talk about the bad stuff to get to how to stop it. Um, so we wrote basically polymorphic source code. It's a mutation engine, but instead of mutating op codes like x86 bytecode, it's actually mutating JavaScript source and Perl source. Uh, basically, we're going to change the syntax of the code there without actually changing the functionality. Uh, and we'll show you that. And also, we're going to change and update the attack vector in the wild. Which has not really been done before. Like, this goes more of like a smart worm almost. That, that it's going to be able to find new vulns, build them in without the person who wrote the worm actually knowing about it. Right, so, so you don't need variants, right? It just, it finds, as soon as they patch one vulnerability, the worm, while it's in the wild, has learned about new vulnerabilities and is now spreading and exploiting through those. Um, so the big things we're going to hit here are how to evade signatures. And you did a lot of the, the adapting the new attack vectors. A, a bit, yeah. Um, like, that's going to spread more of like a biological worm. It, it's going fi to find new items in the wild and it's going to build them in. And it's kind of what the internet's going to allow it to do as how it grows. So if it finds one volume that can only hit one box, it's not going to spread that fast. But as it pulls in, you know, 3,000 different volumes and starts exploiting boxes, it's going to move and keep growing. So, and obviously, you know, we're, what payload you want to put in this worm, you know, that's really outside our discussion because we don't really care. We're trying to figure out how could a worm spread and not be stopped. We don't really care what it's doing. Um, finding and infecting new hosts on multiple domains is another interesting thing. How would a worm that's running about the client and the server do this? Um, real quick, we got to go into traditional malware detection. Uh, right now, uh, we're seeing a lot of stuff like we did with the uh, antivirus scene in the late 80s, early 90s. Virus writers, antivirus. You had very basic viruses, and so they wrote signatures. And then you got polymorphic viruses with like the Dark Avenger mutation engine. I remember reading this thing. Anybody here ever heard of uh, 40A? It's a virus zine. I know you know about it, Patrick. Um, so w there was kind of a, a back and forth, right? They found a way to create polymorphic code, so the people tried to start you know, writing signatures for the algorithms that actually did the polymorphism. Um, we're going to see that exact same thing happen in the web space. We're already seeing it. Um, Semantics got signatures for your manner. I have to keep a lot of web malware on my box, rot 13 and I, can't, I can only look at it in memory. And even then, like, semantic keeps popping up. Uh, so we've seen that attackers, even in the web space, adopted something called JS Wonka. Again, web space, or WebSense and FinGen have done some really interesting work in this on how to actually detect malicious code. Basically what they do is they use a JavaScript interpreter. So this is what we're seeing now in 
basically an obfuscated JavaScript. You, you, it's, they can't signature this. So what they do is they take this and they run it in an isolated sandbox that's you know, with SpiderMonkey. And they keep running it until they get down to the actual code. Because what this does is it decrypts something. It's like Russian dolls, right? You've got one layer of encryption. When, when it's done, there's another one which writes out an iframe, which loads up another piece of code, which does this. And the end result is you get dropped with like an anti exploit or you know, WMF or one of these traditional browser exploits. Um, so the, and they signature the final result. I don't know if you read something. <laughs> I'll just keep going. Well, let's do it. So there's some problems with obfuscation, right? FinGen and WebSense will tell you that they have nice patented algorithms for figuring this shit out. And they probably do. Uh, John and I figured out how to do it in about five minutes. Now, our way probably isn't as good as theirs, but it worked about 80% of the time. The way these things work is they have a big block of data, right? If you actually look at this code, there's a whole bunch of literals, either string literals, numeric literals. Uh, you know, they're, they're storing the ASCII codes or the ASCII character codes of the actual um, source of the virus. And then they cattle the ASCII codes together, convert it to a string, and execute it. But this also doesn't look like, a, like code that a person would write. Yeah. It, it's odd. You know, there's far, far more comments, far more like brackets and yeah. semicolons and everything else in there. So it, it, it's, it's really odd, and that's not going to be normal code. Like that kind of stuff would account for maybe 2%. Exactly. With that, that could be as high as you know, 15 or 30%, and that's going to throw fa uh, flags mm -hmm. just on that. Basically, what you've got is a big block of string literals, somehow data, and then they got a very small amount of code, which actually decrypts that data and executes it. So if you actually look at the ratio of characters that are inside of string literals or are numeric literals, divided by the total size of the code, normal code, about 2% of it is string two to seven percent? Hmm, excuse me, two to seven percent are string literals, numeric literals, things like that. Even obvious, even code that's been all white space reduced. If you go look at like Google's uh, Gmail code, things like that, it's still if you run analysis on it, oh, it's only it's less than ten percent of it is literals. But with obfuscated code that's malicious, it's thirty percent or more. So that's a really easy way to detect whether code is obfuscated in a way that the ma malicious people normally do. Now, it doesn't mean it's malicious. There are a lot of people that try to protect their JavaScript on the client and actually end up with something that is really kind of silly. But it at least lets you know that you're dealing with JavaScript code that someone's trying to hide something. And that should raise some flags. Which is normally people thinking it's, it's some new trick they found. It's some sort of ninja magic. You know, they, they've ported like something great to JavaScript. And they're just trying to hide it, which normally you can figure out without reading their code. Exactly. And there's still, I'll tell you what, if y'all ever want to have fun, do a Google search for right click suppression. You will see people making posts even today that, no, totally, I can stop the JavaScript, with JavaScript, I can stop them from viewing my source code. And it's, it's only like, 1999. <laughs> Yeah, exactly, and it only works with old versions of Netscape or yeah. something like that. It's, it's ridiculous what people think that they can do. They think that they can control the data, but we can analyze this and we can find malicious code. So what we said is instead of trying to hide it right in a big block of crap like this, we're going to hide it in plain sight. What we're going to do is actually mutate the source code. We're just going to have source code, and what we'll do is we will do reversible mutations. So we'll change, say, control structures. And if then else tree is an awful lot like a switch statement, and you actually can mutate them back and forth. Do wows are wow loops with certain types of conditionals. If then else trees can be broken into a series of wow loops with break statements and certain types of conditionals. And so we will actually change the syntax of the code that's there. But functionally, when you run it, it does the exact same thing. But it's going to interpret differently so that if you ran like static analysis against mm -hmm. it, it's different code. And it's getting to the same point at the very end, but it's very context. Exactly. Yeah. Like the, what, which variables are used where, what variables are passed to what functions are going to mutate and change. But the end result is it drops O-Day, or it does this, or it does that. Um, now, it's quite possible what FinGen and uh, WebSense are doing, where they're running something to completion and seeing the end result, might work here. We're, we're still trying to figure that out, but hopefully we can have that discussion. The, the key here, though, is when you're doing source code mutation is, especially when you're a black hat, is that you need reversible mutations. Otherwise, you reach a, uh, you reach a st ah, sed ah, steady state. Too much red. Red Bulls are crazy. <laughs> <laughs> so, you don't want to reach a steady state. And that's a point where you can't mutate anymore. Like, there's a lot of easy ways to get if-then-else trees into something that's not an if-then-else tree. It is very difficult to analyze a piece of code and say, you know what, I can actually import this back to being an if-then-else tree. Uh, and so those are what we call unreversible mutations. The more reversible mutations you have, the better you are. Like, if you had, say, 
80% of your code, 80% of those statements were capable of being mutated, then after it's something like 10 or 12 generations, the probability that a piece of code could still keep getting generated or still be mutated is down to like it's single digit percents. So yeah. even, if you, even if you're like, well, the majority, the vast majority of my code is able to have reversible uh, mutations applied to it, eventually you can pretty quickly reach a steady state. And what could happen is the virus companies could just run it and say, well, of all possible steady states, there's going to be maybe 4,000 of them. So we'll just hash all 4,000. And then eventually we're going to see these things and stop them. But there are ways to get around this, which is more of grammar-guided genetic programming, which we're not going to talk about because that's yeah, really we're, complicated. We're just really lazy and didn't want to do it that way. Are you all like having the post really good party night malaise, or malaise here? Everyone's kind of quiet. Please, if, if we're going too quick or you don't understand something, by all means, you know, interrupt us. Um, so the other thing we want to avoid with sort code mutation is basically expanding the code side without bounds. So one thing that people like to do with, say, numeric literals is if I have, you know, x equals 10, they'll mutate that to x equals parentheses 7 plus 3. Well, the problem is, is you went from having one numeric literal to two. So the next generation, you're going to get, you know, x equals, you know, 3 plus 4 plus 3. And it just it grows and grows and grows. Right. So it's a fine line between expanding and bringing it back. And you've got to collapse these things. It's always harder to, to bring it back to a smaller point because you're not always sure if, if that's going to screw it up to a certain extent. So actually, I should mention it. Some people have talked about this. Uh, uh, LMH has talked about writing something called VOM for uh, Metasploit, which will basically be a, a jolly JavaScript polymorphic engine. He hasn't actually produced it yet, though. I mean, he's a smart guy. I'm sure he will. And he hasn't really talked too much about it. I've seen one or two blog posts about it. And so if he's out there and watching, we did a lot of the work for you. So not that we want to help <laughs> Metasploit, but we can tell you where there are some paths you don't want to take. Which is interesting, though, because finding out what doesn't work, what's easy to detect and find, helps defenders understand, you know what, of these other parts that we don't know how to solve yet, what are kind of like little ways, what are kind of finger holds we might have to be able to stop these things. Um, so the things that we implemented in our mutation engine was mutating control flow, uh, expanding and collapsing literals, and intelligently renaming variables. Which is going from like foo and bar and things like that to a, b, c, d, and instead of putting just random just text, yeah. it, it's got to pull real words. So that it looks more like it's someone wrote it as opposed to someone generated it. Right. Nobody uses a variable named named you know query tree. Or if you do, you should be shot. Or nobody uses you know nobody uses a string of eight um, alphanumeric characters without any vowels. Right. Not just all constants. It's not even an English word. Everybody tends to use camel case. We'll talk about that. One thing we didn't try that was mentioned. Um, by LMH about, I guess, six months ago is when he wrote that Probably, blog yeah. post, was um, creating code blocks. Uh, worthless mutations that they talked about that we found totally won't work at all, that we can detect them, are inserting non-code elements. Like, I'm going to insert random white space. I'm going to insert comments, stuff like that. Which the first thing in static analysis is strip Tokenize it, and so yeah. you're not even looking at white space. Uh, same thing with code block reordering or inserting no ops. So these are just some of the control flow mutations. I, I don't want to belittle these, but you can see very easily uh, a four step or a for loop can be broken out. You do the init step before the while. You have the conditional. You have the step as the last part of the uh, while statement, and it's equivalent. And you'll notice that everything on the left side of the um, of the graph, which mutates to something on the right, everything on the right is on the left as well. So all of these are reversible. You could go from one to the other and back again. And in some cases, you know, actually go to different types of control structures, too. Um, if the last row is wrong. Ah, so this is very true. When you're doing control flow mutation and these types of mutations, you have to be very careful because you can inadvertently change the meaning of the code. So you're right. If there's a continue statement or break statement, different things inside of it, it won't work. So... But the thing is, is that I'm not mutating arbitrary code. You know, the attacker has control over the code. So the attacker can write code that's very simplified. You know, he's always going to use curly braces around his if statements. He's always going to, if he needs to do a break, you know, write the code differently so he doesn't have to have a continue or a break. But th that's a good point. Um, same thing with an if to a while. I can just throw a break at the end of it. Um, if conditionals, you can just reverse the clauses. Which ones are done? Uh, it's, uh, with if statements, though, it's very easy to go one way, but it's very hard to say, wait a minute, is it OK for me to switch these back? In this case, I could just throw another not in front of conditional two, and it's back to the left side again. 
Um, you know, you can bump an if that or an if else into two whales with a conditional and a flag to break out. I mean, kind of silly. Now, uh, switch statements only work with literals because you can't say this is the case for the variable x. You have to actually give it a literal. So it'd be like if x equals equals one. That could be you know that if then else tree on the left can be converted to a switch statement. But you couldn't have something like if x is greater than zero, right? Because if you convert that to a switch statement, you'd have like a bunch of cases to do a big fall through. Uh, you have to actually do it with direct equals. Does that make sense? Okay. Uh, excuse me? Ah. <laughs> Thanks for pointing it out, Patrick. So uh, another thing, control flow manipulation, you break it out into functions. I'm always a big fan of the inline if. I think it's actually called something special. Like, I don't know. I always forget. I don't know. Whenever I'm looking for the syntax, I'm trying to remember what's this called when I type into Google. I just normally type inline if. But an if else can be broken into two functions, and then you just use an inline if. And then just ignore the variable value that gets set. This happens, uh, this necessarily won't, I mean, if you're returning void or the functions are void, if you're talking about, say, C, um, luckily JavaScript and Perl, they don't care about return codes, and you can pretty much do this in JavaScript, no problem. And these are just some basic examples, yeah. which we're finding out that a couple of them are wrong. But, uh, it, like, there's so much more. That it, it, it could go on forever. I mean, right. like, there's probably hours and hours that you can sit there and just, like, write new mutations. So you have to be extremely dangerous with expanding literals. Y'all know what I talk about when I'm saying expanding literals. Take a number, break it out. Take a string and break it into two strings that you concatenate together. Um, you, you have the potential for unchecked growth, right? Because you're taking one literal and you're breaking it into two, and multiple generations later, those are going to get broken. And it's just you have to really throttle and, and be very, you have to basically do uh, weights on what you're mutating when, and uh, you have to have give um, literal expansion a very low weight so it doesn't happen very often. And this is kind of like a script version of a nil op because we can add these on, we can take these off, and we can split them up and throw them back and forth, and it's not going to change what's actually going on. Right. While it could grow to be larger, it's still going to run properly, and it can still change what you're seeing without changing what's actually going to happen. Remember, the whole point is to try to break static um, checks or even some of this analysis where it has nothing to do with we're going to syntactically change it, but functionally it does the same thing. There are some fun ones here, um, some of these languages, floating points uh, that aren't typed, you know, like, say, Perl or JavaScript. You can say, you know, hey, we'll, use an, we'll take this integer. Like, maybe I want to do a, uh, a port sweep on, uh, like, port 8080. And so in my code, I'm going to have 8080 somewhere. And so they're looking for that. Well, I go ahead and do 8080 and make it a decimal. Or I make it, you know, scientific notation or something like that. And I use, like, a math.floor or actually enumerate it out. Uh, I can change the number base. Number base is pretty well known. I mean, none of, none of these things here should be a surprise to you. You have to be very careful when you're doing reversible math operations. Um, you know, in this case, we said 10, and we expanded it to plusing 3 and minus 3. And we randomly picked the number 3. And we also randomly put, picked to use the plus and minus. But if you, say, decide to use divide and multiply, and your random number came up as 0, you're going to crash the code. Uh, same thing with log and exponential, well, if you're using those. Actually, th that's not always a bad thing. Well, it's not going to run for what you need. If you divide by zero, it might crash your code, but so does half the JavaScript on the net. You know, you've got a cursor with stars flying around it. If that's not working, you're probably okay with it, and it's not going to throw an error. So if your code doesn't always mutate properly, it's still going to run, or it's still just going to sit there, and they're not going to see it. Because the chance that like the one the one time it doesn't work falls in the lap of someone who's looking for it is pretty rare. I mean, how many people have seen that little box that IE pops up, which is like, there was a script. Would you like to debug? And then there was a debugger built into it. You have to have Visual Studio. Um, I see that box all the time. It's very annoying because people don't know how to write very good JavaScript. So this this would not be um, abnormal if you saw that. Um, Boolean literals can be expanded too pretty easily. So instead of saying, you know, like, if flag equals false, or, you know, saying variable, you know, is logged on flag equals true, you can say, you know, just replace it with an actual um, inline conditional. You know, uh, alive is equal to, you know, five equal equal five, or seven not equal three. So expand them that way. A lot of people talk about string literal expansion. You know, we'll just break the string in half, um, escape sequences. One of the things you should notice here is that, like, when I do that decompose, I take spot dynamics, I break it into two strings, I increase the length by three characters. 
because I have two extra quotes and a plus. Uh, if you look at actually using like um, ASCII codes to actually represent your strings, I mean, you had six characters, right? It's what, 300, 600%? Yeah, now which, you've got this yeah. string from char code. I mean, it's, it's more than that. It's huge. Which then you've got to bring it back to uh, as it starts to grow. So that could blow up your code within two or three generations to just be enormous. So what started off as maybe a K could turn into like two or three megs. You and know what? That's not going to look like normal web traffic, and that can get the worm caught. We'll just jump to a demo because that's a lot more fun than us talking about it. Yeah. So this is just a really simple factorial example. So there won't be massive amounts, and I have to change that to be a minus. There won't be massive amounts Thanks of much. mutation that can occur here. But so I'm just going to run the code, and I'm taking the factorial of, of 5, 120. And so now I'm just going to start mutating it. And we see that it, it's changing, uh, not by a lot. It's still 120. So I'm taking things like um, you know variable equals variable minus one, and we can actually recognize that and mutate it. And here we see we're using the minus equals operator. Um, I'm changing between while loops and for loops. I'm renaming. Uh, we don't do any function ordering. You would need some pretty complicated static analysis to figure out which statements depend on which other statements and where you're allowed to reorder. Which is not that bad when you're talking about PHP or JavaScript. Perl, on the other hand, not that fun. Um, we, Perl is not a lexical language, so the only thing that can really interpret Perl is Perl. So like, you end up in this really, really nasty piece where you can't run through and tokenize Perl properly because dollar score undersigned sucks a lot. So yeah, it, it's not that hard for, for JavaScript and PHP and things like that to build a tokenizer and to, to actually do it right. Um, but Perl is kind of a lost cause. Um, <laughs> so it like helps it, us. We like yeah, it. Yeah, like in more yeah. ways than one, it's a lost cause. <laughs> so intelligent variable renaming. One of the things we see when people talk about source code mutation is they say, oh, we'll just rename the variables. Well, there are two big problems with variable renaming. One, you have to know what you're allowed to touch and rename and where what you're allowed to rename it to. For example, you can't rename keywords, right? You can't just use a regex to find alphanumeric you know, strings and then just mutate them. Also, you can't mutate um, things that might be uh, environment-supplied objects, like in JavaScript, you know, window, document. You don't want to try to mutate dollar sign underscore because that's kind of meaningful in Perl. So there are certain global objects, supplied functions, things like that from the environment that you can't mess with. But but like you can set things like document and window to to like A or B or some Other sort of variable, variables. which at first glance is fine. But if you're doing some sort of static analysis on it, it's going to get caught. Exactly, because they're going to have to. Basically, our point is, is that you're not going to be able to use signatures anymore. And WebSense or WebSense and uh, Finjin are already starting to do very primitive, it appears, static analysis. They don't really talk about what they're doing. And uh, believe me, I tried to get them really drunk last night, so they tell me, and it didn't work. Um, something about proprietary trade secrets. I don't know. I tuned them out. Non-disclosure. <laughs> So uh, what we're trying to say is that you're going to need to do detailed static analysis. And setting you know, the keyword window to a variable and then using that variable farther down the line, I'm going to be building standard used def chains. I mean, all of these things are familiar to people who know about compilers. I'm going to be able to trace every use of that variable. And it, you're not going to be able to really hide that you're using window from me. Um, so also, uh, you have to know what to rename it to, right? Not do a random character sequence. We found that source code obviously is not English prose, right? I mean, you're not reading Emily Dickinson here. But uh, it's similar <laughs> in a lot of ways. In fact, JavaScript and Perl can be dark and depressing and foreboding just like Emily Dickinson, especially when you're trying to debug it. And why doesn't IE have a debugger? I'm looking at you, Microsoft people. <laughs> so I know there's a free one now, but I mean, it's no firebug. You guys got a long way to go. So uh, no sane developer uses, I'm, I'm picking on y'all a little much, I'm sorry. So no insane developer uses that as a variable name. I mean, camel case is pretty much the de facto thing that people use now. You want self-documenting code. This is what they're teaching in colleges. I mean, of course, back in the day, they thought Hungarian no notation was all the rage. And now we kind of you know, shudder when we see it. So you know, this could be out of date in a couple of years. Who knows? But what you need to do is we need to not randomly generate a variable name. We need to randomly generate a variable name that looks like a real variable name. So we do this by generating camel case. We, we say, let's generate two or three words, or things that look like English words, and then case them appropriately so we end up with something. Uh, and you can't just randomly pick 20, you know, number between 1 and 26 and use that as a letter, right? You have to use character frequencies. E is 12%. I mean, 12% of all letters are E. 
at least in the English language, when you know you're doing, uh, and we're, by the way, we're pulling all this stuff. I mean, this is what they do in frequency analysis, um, and very breaking, ah, excuse me, breaking very basic crypto algorithms. Um, they use these types of things. Same things with digraphs, pairs of letters. So we, you have to build these in. Uh, we actually did not get to finish the uh, the variable renaming. As you saw, my variable names were pretty bad. But this just makes sense. It's some slight modifications. You apply weight to certain types of letters, apply weights to certain pairs of letters. Also, you need to generate reasonably length words, right? You only want things that are like five letters. You don't want to generate 28 word long thing. And also, the ratio of vowels to consonants in English is it varies a little bit. The longer the word, the lower the ratio. But I mean, look at source. Yeah, it sits right? around. Four, like source is 50% vowels. 40%, yeah. Prose is what? 40% vowels. Yeah. So, you know, these things are, uh, you, you want to try to make it similar to what they have. Uh, uh, one thing you can do instead of trying to generate words to go ahead and change variable names is use nearby words. So if I've got a code execu or command execution volume on the server and I'm running code, I'm just going to grab the Unix dictionary and pull some words out and you know slap together platypus and peanut. I don't know. That would be really weird if you ended up with two p words. Yeah. <laughs> you can also grab files of the web root, right? Just grab HTML files or uh, text files and just pull out English words. You know, you might end up with you know like the license file and that would be really boring <laughs> generated word. Herein to relinquish a lot of word, a lot of lawyer talk. Um, also, you have to be very careful though. Uh, on the client, for example, you could uh, go ahead and just use JavaScript to say, let me look at the entire page, let me walk the DOM and all the text nodes, pull the text out of them and use those. But in this case, you're actually dealing with English words. So the probability that you're going to get something that's a keyword or a global word, something that's reserved, is higher. The chance I'm randomly going to generate the word with or for or this or null are pretty small. But if I'm grabbing them from a page, it gets uh, a lot more likely. Which is why you've got to check back to make sure that it's not a safe word. Exactly. And we'll tell you how we actually implemented this stuff towards the end. So this is just a function to extract words from the okay. documents. Uh, ah, code block. code block creation. This is something we did not do. It was suggested in a couple of the, the little pieces of literature we read. Uh, basically, you know, on the left you've got you know, three statements. And so instead what you do is you just break those statements out into functions and call the functions. Um, the reason we didn't do this is that you multiple generations down the line, you're going to end up with nothing but lots of little one-line functions that are getting called. And one-line functions that call one-line functions that call one-line functions that finally actually do something. Uh, this is really dangerous. You can have a lot of unchecked growth if you're trying to do uh, code block creation. And also, trying to collapse these things back down is really hard. You know, it's easy for me to take three statements and wrap them in, in dummy functions and then call them. It's very hard from uh, an analysis point of view, an automated point of view, to say, yeah, these three functions, can I actually break those back out into just their statements and inline them back in? So. Which we didn't do it more because we're back to we're really lazy on this one. Because <laughs> It's the whole tokenizer thing where you've got to do it properly and then it's grammar guided. So we actually yeah, didn't, we didn't implement, the way our mutation engine works, we did not actually implement a full-blown language tokenizer and parser. Um, what we do is we run through the source code we want to mutate and we build a table of where all the strings are. From this index to index this is a string. We then use regexes. You can show them the code in a little bit, parts of the code. Sure. Uh, we, we then use regexes to try to find the beginning of where, or, you know, wow clauses, the beginning of if then else trees, things like that. Do a little bit of a state machine to get the whole block, and that's what we do. So we're not doing full blown, you know, static analysis. Yeah, so there's. Because that would be a lot of code. Yeah, like there's stuff where you've got like 47 nested ifs, it might not catch it properly. Correct. And also, you can't really. And, but that gets back to the fact you're controlling the code, so you can write something that's simpler. Yeah. Uh, like we said, it might work. It suffers from steady state, right? Eventually, you're going to end up with nothing but one-line functions, and that's all your code is. It's very hard to reverse. And again, we need a very complex mutation engine to kind of like collapse them, and that would be pretty big to have as the payload of a worm. So there are some snake oil mutations, too, things that just don't help you at all. I mean, yeah, they'll help you get around a really brittle and very static regex that someone's using, but already we see that people like WebSense and FinGen aren't using those anymore. Um, so it's wor like we said, it's worthless if they're performing any type of analysis. Uh, things like white space and comments, they immediately get stripped. Which is kind of a cool thing, actually, because <laughs> then you could hide code in white space. Because if they're going to run static analysis or something against it, you hide your code in white space, and like the little bit that, that you actually run 
is not code that it can see. We actually have this. Um, I gave a talk yesterday. Brian, uh, Brian Sullivan and my coworker of mine are writing a book about Ajax security that actually you can get on Safari now. But we actually put in the book um, code that um, is trying to show how you can't look at JavaScript and figure out what it does. It takes. Um, code and encodes it as white space. So you give it a block of code and it converts it to white space. And what you end up with is this block of code with a comment, what looks like a long white line, another comment, and then a little function. And what the function does is it says, hey, let me do a string search and find the beginning of that function and the end of that function. And what's actually in that white space is a tab is zero, a space is one, and a carriage return line feed tells you that you're done. And so it's seven bit ASCII representing the actual code. And you we encode it into white space. That. And so yeah. the great thing is, if you're performing analysis on this, the very first thing that happens is they disregard all the white space. So if WebSense or Finjin is you know, running it to its steady state, they won't ever see this, because it's all going to get stripped away. Um, we also didn't do code block reordering. You know, If you're going to reorder where your functions are, the function declarations, not where they're called, that doesn't really help, right? I mean, if my, if my code uses three functions, and they're normally ordered one, two, and three, and I renumber them so it's three, two, one, or something like that, I mean, the code's still going to run. But from an, an analysis point of view, that's not a very interesting mutation. Because once you start getting into building abstract syntax trees or parse trees, you're going to go where the location of a function is or the location of a code block. It doesn't matter. You, you're not really thinking about order at that point. It, you basically have abstracted that away, if that makes sense. Are you all really bored or good? OK. I, I know we're going really demos? fast, but uh, I know that, and I know some of this is kind of complex. But So source code no ops. There, this is really easy to do. And there's tons of them, right? I can build if, you know, if false in a code block, and that'll never run. You know, if true, and then the very first thing is a break. Um, you know, I can multiply variables, and them with themselves, you know, double knot them, divide by one. I mean, there's tons of stuff I can do. And those, those literals there, are those, um, these no-ops are actually good because now, you know, x times 1. Now I've got a variable, but I also have a numeric literal that I can then break apart. And so it, it, it's fertile ground for letting you have lots of mutations, but it's really easy to detect, especially with static analysis. Who here has compiled and never seen the warning unreachable code detected, right? Because the compiler, when it's actually ge doing code generation, can say, wait a minute, this code block's never going to run. So identifying no ops, and also when it's doing optimizations, it's going to say, wait a minute, we don't need that, we don't need that. So when you're, you're trying to detect no ops, when you're doing stack analysis, it's very easy to find these things. So it's not particularly an effective mutation. But and also huge unchecked growth, right? You right. put something into the code that's not going to do anything, and oh, by the way, you're going to mutate it into more stuff that doesn't do anything. And for worms, that's something that's kind of hard to, to check yourself, because as it grows and as it throws in more and more stuff, that's not going to be used or that's just going to blow it up into more garbage. That stuff that you would have to have pretty much like an optimizer built into a compiler that right. sits inside of your worm. Again, with so, the worm we tried to yeah. implement as simply as possible without having to actually tug along a full JavaScript tokenizer uh, and parser. We wrote one recently. We actually did a demo in our talk yesterday about uh, analyzing obfuscated JavaScript and things like that. And for that, we wrote a full one in C Sharp. Um, but you, it's not really practical to try to pull that along. So this is the fun thing, right? Updating the attack vectors in the wild. We're going to release the worm, and it's going to have maybe three SQL injections and a cross-site scripting attack that it knows about. He's speaking hypothetically. We're not actually going to release the worm. No. <laughs> no. That would be bad. Uh, I wonder how many banks there are in China that are SQL injectable. It'd make an interesting weekend. <laughs> it would. So um, this prevents the silver bullet fix, right? Because if we start it with three vulnerabilities, you can go ahead and eventually, as soon as somebody gets a copy of the word, they're going to say, wow, you patched these three vulns, and the worm's not going to propagate anymore. It's you know, the whole SQL slammer. Granted, there might be variants that people kick out later, but if you patch the box, it's not going to get exploited. So to be really evil, you've got to update how you exploit them while the worm's in the wild instead of trying to release variants all the time. Also, the FBI can track you down a lot faster if you keep pumping these things out from your IP, different variants. So what we're going to do, there are two ways you can actually update these methods. You can actually fetch and parse new known vulnerabilities from security websites while it's in the wild, or you can actually discover vulnerabilities on the fly. Um, now, only we'll certain vulns are interesting. Both, don't we? Yeah, yeah, we'll get right. to, we'll go past the next slide. So only certain vulns are interesting, right? Because we're looking at things like 
cross-site scripting, command execution, SQL injection, file upload. But you know, it's got to be stored cross-site scripting, and and, store, and like for the SQL injection, yeah. it's got to be reflected back. I mean, it, there's certain things that a normal cross-site scripting attack might not be good because you can't really hit people like without directing it toward them. But these uh, attacks, you've got to fish them to right. kind of pull it off. The, but these attacks right. are good. I mean. As I'm sure Arshnake knows, he goes ahead and pounds away on trying to actually get cross-site scripting to exploit or something like that with various attack vectors. Uh, it doesn't crash the box, right? I can sit there pounding on MySpace all day with trying to get around their filters, and sometimes do. But, <laughs> but you know, I can do that. I'm not going to crash the box. I'm going to generate some network traffic. But it's not like I, I did a buffer overflow and I messed up and I cored the process. So it's really good. These types of vulns are very good because once the, once the worm is aware of, there's a cross-site scripting vulnerability in this version of this product. It affects this parameter, and it's on this, it's on this say, this file or this page. Maybe it doesn't know the exact attack string it needs to do, but it can go ahead and put kind of like a preamble on the front of its attack that it'll know maybe will break it out of a comment or break it out of attributes. So the worm can kind of figure out how to get around the filters. It just needs to know where to actually inject. Um, so like we said, buffer overflows, format string vulnerabilities, they're not really going to help us here. But they could if you switch over to something like a Metasploit exploit. Where That's true. Because this is a scripted language and Metasploit is Perl, you can get you know, the, the one exploit that you need and you, you can run that. So, the, so if you pull something that, that's not a browser, you can probably run that and continue an infection that's no longer web-based. Exactly. And this is where it goes into more of like a hybrid sense that it's not just scripted languages. Now, now a scripted worm can also start to control boxes that, that were infected via a, like a buffer overflow or a heap overflow. You know, the, there's so much that can be done if you're going back and forth, and it can keep moving, and, and it can get past things that weren't designed to have web access, and all of a sudden you kind of bridge that gap. Right. Like, for example, if there's a command execution vulnerability or there's, say, a SQL injection vulnerability and I can access a stored procedure that lets me run commands, I can run a command to pull Metasploit down and then run Metasploit on the server. And so I can, instead of trying to find buffer overflows and then try to, you know, get everything all working, I just use a pre-made exploit. And I've got all of Metasploit, which will give me all sorts of exploits. So this is where security vendors hurt us because they like to talk about how cool and sexy they are. They want... And, Hey, I work for a security vendor and we do this too. We'll go ahead and post, hey, there's this vulnerability. It's this criticality. Uh, here's the affected version. There's a patch available. And you know, here's maybe some little more information about it. But the thing is, the security vendor vets the vulnerability for you. He tells you, I mean, Sukuni is not going to publish something that isn't really vulnerable. You know, so it's not like I'm having to read full disclosure, right? It's not like the worm has to read full disclosure and try to parse out some 13-year-old Brazil going, I have leaked skills and bad English and <laughs> describing how he's doing a command ejection vuln, right? Sicunia takes the 13-year-old Brazilian who can't speak good English and puts it into a nice, well-formed document that I can understand. Can't speak English well. Ah, uh, oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> so... <laughs> So uh, it, they basically vet the real vulns out for me. Uh, and then they produce vulnerability reports in a very known format. They tell me the type of vuln, the product, affected versions, is there a patch, what's exploitable. Sometimes they actually give me the attack string. But even if they don't get me an attack string, we can figure it out. They tell me if it's patch available. Even better, they put this information in RSS which is machine consumable. So in some cases, I'm having to screen scrape, but sometimes they're just like, hi, here's an RSS block of what that vulnerability is. Just consume this, and now you know how to attack you know, PHPBB, or now you know how to attack you know, shopping cart XYZ. Um, and it, it auto-updates, which is nice. So you can discover vulnerabilities on the fly by pulling down, say, a scanner. If you're running on the server, you could grab a web vuln scanner like Nikto. Uh, if you're running on the client, you could grab a web vuln scanner like Jikto. Um, which you know certainly needs to be fleshed out, but all you really care about, you don't care about known checks or fixed checks. You don't care that there's a directory called admin that we can access because that's not going to help you. You're looking for things like cross-site scripting, SQL injection attacks. You're looking for kind of like you, it's not a, the, you don't have the attack string, but you want to try to exploit it. Um, so it generates lots of traffic, but scanners are very helpful for when it's a custom app, right? You know. No one's publishing that there's this vulnerability in your application. Uh, also, uh, I could have a website, and I've got robots.txt, so that I, maybe I do have PHPBB, but I have robot.txt up there, so Google never indexed it. 
Google doesn't know. If I do a Google dork looking for vulnerable versions, I would never find you. But if the worm is running in your subnet and or inside your intranet and go ahead and does a web scan, I can now find you. Um, so how do we find infected hosts? Well, search engines, of course. Uh, like I said, unless we're actually running and doing you know, sweeps of your intranet. Uh, on the server, this is easy, right? I have code execution. So I can go ahead and you know, either talk directly to um, you know, Google through Perl, LWP. You, know, you could do it on the command line with curl or wget. You know, this isn't complicated. Uh, on the client, it's a little harder to do cross-domain communication in JavaScript because you're not supposed to be able to do it, but you can. Um, it, it has to deal with web proxies, and I don't really have enough time to go into this, but this is a pretty well-known thing that kind of got discovered by a PDP last year, and he's talked quite a bit about it. I've talked quite a bit about it. Um, Google actually also has something called the Google search, the Ajax API search, where you can actually, in JavaScript, basically tell Google, hey, Google, search for this, and when you're done, call this function and give me the results. So I can actually query Google without having to do any crazy hoops. So we basically use Google to find hosts. Uh, but for a client side also that works for, uh, for port scanning mm -hmm. and for different kinds of fingerprinting, where, where you can go after like the inside of a network, and, and you can start going through the, the 10 range, the 192, and you can start finding stuff that you would normally need a server for. Exactly. So now that we know how we can contact a search engine to find these new volumes, because Think about the progression here. We're mutating the code so you can't signature it. It's going to have certain vulnerabilities it's exploiting, but we have found ways to contact, say, Secunia or these other people and actually extract the information. Oh, I didn't show that. So I, this isn't actually hooked up for where it will actually contact Secunia through a cross-domain way, but, I mean, we've already kind of showed that in previous conferences with Jikdo and some of these other uh, worms that are out there. So I'll just go ahead and I heart Secunia. So this is a, um, a Secunia advisory. And so, you know, I grab the, the HTML. You're just, this is like the setting the stage, do loop, do loop, just trust me, hand-waving, this is what happened. Uh, you know, somehow you grab the HTML, which you can do through a cross-domain request, you know, going through a web proxy, you know, using Google Translate in ways they never intended. Um, and I mean, at this point, this isn't all, ooh, not that. This isn't even all that super sexy, right? It's just regexes. But Secunia has very regular reports. They, there are three paragraphs or four paragraphs. The first paragraph is literally the format, blank has found a vulnerability in blank version blank. <laughs> Next paragraph, the affected parameters are blank, blank, and blank, and the page is blank. And so we just use very simple regexes to extract all this information out. Uh, let me go ahead and copy this. And that's when we have to do screen scraping. That's assuming they didn't just give it to me in a, um, in a RSS feed that's already consumable. So we just throw that in there, and we see that there's, the product is Form Processor Pro. Uh, it's version 4.0. Uh, form processor pro.php and form processor pro.pl are vulnerable. Uh, this is cross site scripting. It didn't pop up. And the parameter that you want to attack is base path. In which case, I take this information, I immediately go to Google and I say, hey, find me things that say powered by, you know, uh, form processor pro version 4.0. Uh, let me scrape all of those. Let me find the, or, and in URL is base path or what have you. Find it and exploit it. Um, so going back to here. So we, we've mutated the source code so they can't stop us. We update the vulnerabilities on the fly. Um, the trick is we want to make sure that they can't stop us from uh, searching Google and finding targets. I mean, that's how Santi got stopped. Right. So what we want to do is the fact that we're searching for multiple vulnerabilities is going to kind of help. But Google could always say, hey, we know this worm's in the wild. We know it just was able to pull down this new exploit. We know there are versions of it that are now exploiting this. If we ever see someone doing a search for powered by, you know, what was that, form processor pro, just give them an error and, you know, give them maybe a Turing test before they get their results back. So what we do is we mutate the search string. We go ahead and say, well, you know, you normally use uh, modifiers like all in URL or in URL. If anybody here does a lot of Google hacking, um, well, we can, we can use those interchangeably. We can add words that we know Google's going to ignore so that the query looks different, but actually it returns the same results. You know, I can, like, for example, Google only returns the first, you know, thousand pages. So I could do a search for, you know, powered by XYZ123 and powered by XYZ123 copyright 2007. 
that's probably going to get me back almost the exact same result set, even though the search string is entirely different. But we're not positive because it's kind of magic at the end of the day. For, yeah. for what it strips and what it doesn't. Yeah, I'm not sure where Google applies this. I'm not sure how much they normalize the query before they say, wait a minute, is this a bad query or not? So. Yeah, because if it goes for the sting, you might get a good movie or you get the best part of the police. So it, it, it could go either way. It's going to strip out or it might not, and it's kind of case specific. Right. So payloads of the worm are certainly interesting. I mean, it's really at this point whatever you want. Um, it run, if, if you're exploiting the web server and we're on the, the server component of the hybrid, uh, I'm running with the privileges of the web server. So I can bootstrap local exploits. Uh, I can do privilege escalation attacks. You, you can know, write back out the files. Pull so out Metasploit. Get, right. You know, whatever you want to do. Uh, if you're on the client, you can do all this crazy JavaScript stuff that we've seen over the last year or two. Um, stealing your her search history, uh, port scanning, fingerprinting, cross-site request forging into intranet applications. But that's really loud, so it's kind of like an, a crazy drunk guy going through the halls of a church. You know he's there. Right. Uh, certainly, like, uh, search the, or, uh, stealing history and stuff, luckily it's all DOM manipulations, but certainly port scanning, fingerprinting. If I'm doing cross-site request forgings or like the, uh, the MHTML hack, things like this, these are very, they're very distinctive requests. Um, you know, Jikto is extremely loud. Uh, and so another fun thing you could do is use Dominatrix, which is what we wrote. Uh, I was, Those are actually my legs. <laughs> well, I, was, I was sitting around at TourCon, and, and Dan Kaminsky and I were still a little hungover, and he said, you know what, somebody should make a cool called Dominatrix. And I'm like, yeah, the Dom. It, it abuses the Dom, and the Dom likes it. And so he's like, well, we got the name. <laughs> we got to think of what a tool could actually be that does this. And so I'm like, okay, well... We could make it a SQL injector because, I mean, the, we, we've seen really a progression in all the nasty stuff you can do with JavaScript. And there are some great guys doing work in this field, you know, Jeremiah and Rsnake and PDP. Um, and we see all of these things progressing, right? We started with, you can port scan. And then we got to, okay, we found hosts, but now you can fingerprint them and find out what they're running. And then the next logical step that I took in uh, March was, okay, well, if we're fingerprinting them, we can find vulnerabilities on them too. So I wrote Jikto. And then the next logical step is, well, if we're finding vulnerabilities, we can write exploit tools in JavaScript too, which is what Dominatrix is. Uh, it only exploits verbose SQL injection, uh, and it only works on SQL Server, but I mean, this stuff's trivial. I mean, the logic of how SQL injection works, the nuances of whether you're doing a cast or convert, whether you're talking to, you know, sys objects or SQLite master, you know, it, it just depends on the database. So the, the base work's done, and like I said, trivial to expand it. Um, no, we're not going to share the code with you. And no more foreplay, sugar, it's demo time. So, actually, I have this over here. Yeah, it's up. Later. <laughs> so glad Matt right. didn't set a timeout on that thing. Yeah, me too. <laughs> All right, so we're just running this against local hosts, but again, using the cross domain web proxy or anything else, you're fine. I'm going to throw up Firebug, which I absolutely love. And please, Microsoft, for the love of God, make this work with your product. Um, so this is, will be great because it's going to show us all the AJAX requests it's making in the background. And again, we would just be bouncing this through a web proxy like Google Translate to do this cross-domain. It's really trivial. So we actually run, you know, submit, and we see it start banging away. And all of these are, you know, it's doing selects and casts, select and cast. So this is it actually extracting the data. Now we've got a site called Pugnose, which is just this trivial movie site. It's still going. 13 seconds, 15 seconds. So it's grabbing all of these things out, um, dumping the table. And so first thing we did was dump sips. Ah, there we go. I probably should have run through a proxy. Well, you guys can actually see this. It's in the query string, though, so I'd have to do it. So that one, we did a tick or just to see if we get an ODBC error message. And if we actually look at the response, which was a 500, which is a pretty good indicator that we got one. Yeah, ODBC error, unclosed quotation mark, which is quite possibly my favorite error besides seeing an alert box that says XSS. And so we now know that it's SQL injectable. So um, we move along, especially when the XSS is in a bank. So obviously we just proceeded to dump this stuff. And if we look, I mean, anybody who's used a SQL injector, this should be very familiar to you. Um, there were nine tables. So for table TBL categories, there were only two columns in one row because this bookstore, actually, I'll just show you the bookstore. as it pulls up. So this is our little training site, and it just sells some DVDs. You know, you've got Hackers, which is a horrible movie. You have Sneakers, which is a phenomenal movie. And 
we're just exploiting this. I mean, you have to, you know, hand wave and say, okay, this is running one of those, you know, versions that we, you know, pull from Sakunia that said this shopping cart software is vulnerable to SQL injection or what have you. And so this is actually where we're attacking. And so we're actually, you know, doing your, you know, union or and union select type stuff. Uh, and casts actually dump everything out. And so if we go back to Dominatrix, we see that, you know, it's just dumping all these things out. There actually weren't any credit cards because I reset the database. There are three customers. Um, these tabs don't really line it up, but we see customer address, billing address, you know, nulls, some, you know, fictitious or fictional realms, billy at bank.com, you know, Billy Banks, let me, wow, my, That's Billy Banks man. apparently has a password that is let me in. <laughs> wow, I need to make this site a little more realistic. So we, we dumped, we dumped all nine tables. We see some fun stuff. So I mean, again, this, this shouldn't be a shock to you. If you, if this is the first time you were seeing SQL injection, I feel really sorry for you because you probably haven't understood a single thing we have said the entire time up here. Um, so, but the interesting thing is, is that this is a SQL injector written in JavaScript. So, we can show a little bit of this without actually showing all of it. And I, again, I, uh, I, I there's no URL that can appear for a long period of time where someone can snipe it like what happened before. <laughs> so, you know, we're just doing row counts with selects to actually count things out, Ex you know, extract from the response. We go ahead and actually use a regex to pull out from the uh, ODBC error message. Uh, we see here where we're actually building uh, the table. If we want to get the data statement, we pass in the table name, the column, the row number, and the where clause we want to give it, and it just builds these attacks. I mean, this is pretty basic SQL injector stuff. Um, but like I said, the interesting part is it's written in JavaScript, so we have attack tools in JavaScript. Does anybody have any questions? No one has any questions. That's a little shocking. The mutation engine? Yeah, sure. Uh, uh, can we give that one out? Uh, no, we can't give that out. <laughs> we can tell you about it, certainly. How much time do we have left? 15? Oh, great. OK, yeah, well, we can, we can slow it down a little bit, because I know I've been talking a mile a minute, and uh, kind of talk about that a little. Let's check what's left, just to make sure that we don't oh, okay. like, lose anything. <laughs> Sounds good. Uh, so we had like 40 slides. Yeah, we're pretty good. Ah, so possible right. defense. We can talk about, we'll show you the implementation in a moment, but let's talk about some of the possible defense that we could have for this thing, right? Because we're, we're talking about source code mutation and not being able to signature it, and that's kind of scary. So I would like to try to help people try to stop these things. Anybody here a computer science major? I'm sure there are a lot of you. You've probably heard of McCabe complexity diagrams. McKay complexity diagrams basically are saying, look, we don't care what the syntax is. This is how nested the code is. If you're actually looking over here, I can't do it for both, so there are more people sitting over here. Sorry. If you look at this, right, this right here is a loop. And inside the loop, there's an if statement. And it can go to this code block or this code block. There's a little bit of code after that if then else or if else. And then it comes back and the loop repeats. There you've got an, uh, an if without an else clause because it comes back. And so this basically shows you how nested the code is, how complex the code is. And there's actually rules about if you have, you count the number of closed loops, and that's your overall complexity. Like this has a complexity of two. But this, this is a distinct fingerprint of the functionality of the code. So this basically says, look, I, like when I'm looking at this, I have no idea whether this is a while loop, a do while loop, a for loop, whatever it is. But I know that there's, a, there's some type of loop followed by some type of conditional code followed by a um, going back to here. So even if this if else got replaced by like a wow and a wow that had a break and the conditionals were set, I would still see this same type of code. So if you mutate the syntax of the source code, you're not changing the functionality of the code. And since a McCabe complexity diagram maps the functionality of the code, it's always going to be the same. So I can mutate the hell out of a factorial, or I can mutate the hell out of dominatrix, and it's going to have the same complexity diagram. But this is neat, but it's also not going to work in all cases, because there's so many. Uh, it's kind of like, uh, uh, like for a hash that, you know, it could be 32 bytes, but we've seen a lot of hash collisions. Right. This is, it's based, you know, like, like the number of bytes you have is pretty much the number of statements that you right. have. I mean, let's ignore, yeah. ignore this top part because it's kind of chopped. Just go from seven down over here. You're, you're basically dealing with, I mean, there's something that had an if without an else, an if without an else, 
of some type of loop with an if else inside. That probably describes a lot of programs. So it's, it's a fingerprint of functionality, but there are going to be a lot of things that have the same functionality in terms of their control structure. So we probably need to do more work on these. We're trying to figure this out, but we totally acknowledge that we're not necessarily the smartest of people, especially when you start getting into this really complicated stuff, because I slept through half of theory. <laughs> so you know, we're working on it, but please feel free to come talk to us. We think this probably has pretty good potential to actually detect source code mutation, because you can't alter the underlying functionality. Um, but by all means, please come and talk to us. We will gladly give you our research on this. In fact, we should probably just put together a white paper and publish it. Sounds In fact, actually, we did. I guess it's on your CD. <laughs> so, so another possible thing here, right, is you can look at the traffic that's generated. And this certainly isn't unique to webworms, right? You can do this to any type of worm, you know, but not the content, because we're mutating the attacks, we're mutating the search strings. But if you're looking at something and it's like, all right, here's a Google query, and it was followed by these multiple types of HTTP requests, you know, it's, it's just traffic class, it's classic traffic analysis. But then it's also weird when, like, it's not done right, where, where like, you might infect a server, and it didn't write out to the page to get a client to, to exploit the next point. So why, why is a server that, that runs, like, SON, why, why is that now viewing with Firefox a page? Right. Ch chances are it's not going to if it's got Solaris on it. Or why is MySpace.com, the server on MySpace.com, using you know, what looks like the user agent for wget to contact Wachovia.com? That's really weird. There's no reason a web server should contact that other web server. It might happen with like a web service, but you are yeah, a mashup. Yeah, like it's, it, it, it's known at that point. Right, so. you designed the app. You, you should know what other web servers your web server is talking to because it's either going to be talking to some type of you know, open API or other servers you control, a database tier, something like that. So any type of traffic that isn't supposed to be there should be pretty obvious. And you can check the functionality of a browser in some cases, but it, it's so odd from, from version to version. It, it, it doesn't always work properly because most people that take like uh, Perl or something like that and, and try and fake a browser, can't fake the actual functionality of the browser and, and how it process things. Everyone who thinks so. that writing a web scanner is easy, you should talk to me, talk to that man right there, God. to the guy next to him. It, yeah, you can, you can write <laughs> uh, a breadth first search crawler in six lines of Perl, but when you start dealing with session state and flash, you can talk to me. Um, tra you can also look at the traffic that the payload generates, right? Scans, port scans, fingerprinting, all of this stuff is very loud. Um, and so the, the only downside to this defense is that it's all reactive. You're using this to identify hosts that have already been owned, um, which is not ideal. At least you're detecting that you're getting screwed, right, because we're mutating the source. So you're seeing the source travel, and that's not getting flagged. But based on kind of, it's like seeing the shadow of something without actually seeing the something. Which is good and bad, but. That sounded very surreal, but I've been drinking a lot of Red Bull, yeah, so yeah. who knows. Yeah, like you've got so many clients, though, that can do all the infections, so you're kind of jumping from client to client to check, okay, this guy's infecting me, wait, no, this guy's infecting me, and it's jumping all over the place, so while it's loud, it's going to be really hard to, to trace that and to actually have a trail. Exactly. So, I mean, kind of to sum all this up, it ultimately comes down to having secure web apps. Right? Because all of these things are, are being able to propagate because of cross-site scripting. SQL injection that I can get to a store procedure for command execution. Um, you know, uh, file uploading. Um, you know, command execution vulnerabilities. Different things like that. Um, you know, file injection. PHP injection. Different things like this. So if your web app's secure, there's nothing for it to feed on. It can't propagate anywhere. Um, that, that's true of like a corporate architecture too. Like for, for stuff that, that's going to be... For all intents and purposes, a, a, a critical app, you probably want to use client-side search. You want to block it off so that it's not the same browser that's going MySpace. Because if, if one browser can see MySpace and it can see like an internal thing for a hedge fund that's got all of the models in it, well, that's probably not good. It's got a shared resource that MySpace can now see the models inside of an hedge fund. It's getting frightening, right? But yeah. because I can basically, once I get your browser, your browser is now acting as a proxy and sending the request that I tell it to, air gaps are a pretty good looking solution. I'm sure that you don't have to go to that extreme, but it, it works for the government. <laughs> and they seem to like that a lot, even though they probably are spending lots of taxpayers' dollars to give everyone two machines connected to, you know, Spider-Net and yeah, well, but not. Like one gets a rate of A and the other gets like a rate of F, so. <laughs> good point. Yeah. So obviously, 
the number one rule of web application security is don't trust the client. You cannot trust the client. Why are you people still trusting the client? We've been telling you this for 10 years. Um, everything can be modified. Uh, you know, hidden HTML input parameters, cookies, you all should know this by now. Um, obviously, you also should know never use anything for the client without sanitizing it. And there's still really bad advice about sanitizing, um, not from the web security, but from developer resources, you know, that people are talking about Ajax. In fact, I'll just go ahead and call them out. So there was a book, I'm writing a book on Ajax, but there was a book that came out pretty recently on Ajax, and there aren't a lot of them, so you all be able to figure it out. This is a book on web security, and they don't even use, they have input validation constitutes a paragraph. The first part, uh, actually two paragraphs. The first paragraph is on blacklisting, which apparently this person has never heard the term blacklisting because they call it like, like negative tamper or something like that. I don't know. He was, it didn't even make sense. And he said, so, you know, if you, you obviously shouldn't see single tick or greater than sign, less than sign. If you see those, the input is bad. That's blacklisting. That's saying, I'm seeing something that's bad, so I'll reject it. He then proceeds to say, the thing you should do is positive validation or something. So if you know something's supposed to be a name and you see a tick mark, it's bad. And I'm like, wait, that's blacklisting. What are you doing? You should, it's not if you see a tick mark. It's if it is exactly a zip code. And if it's not five digits, you throw it away. So enforce data types. You know, is it only supposed to be numbers, only supposed to be letters? You know, formatting things, right? Not thanks, five. So you've got very distinct formats for some of these things. If you're doing with a credit card, don't just accept 16 digits. Expect, accept 16 digits. That also matches the mod 10 checksum on the last digit. If you have a telephone number or social security, don't accept anything over 701 because those aren't valid social security numbers. And a post does not solve cross-site scripting. <laughs> or cross-site request forging yeah, for that it, matter. It, it doesn't happen and people still say, well, it, you can't cross-site script me. I've got posts. Like, I don't have to follow a link. I can build a form and post it. So it's, yeah, it's... Right. And also... It, it, we, we've got a lot of time till we like, get people past that point. We're trying to get them there, John. We're trying. Uh, so length restrictions is another really important one, right? A lot of people will say, okay, well, hey, I'm only going to allow alphanumeric data, right? Well, too bad you allowed, you know, 200K of it. Uh, everybody here use tiny URL? You should do a Google search for tiny disk. I wrote something about two years ago where they accept arbitrary large amounts for their database. And so I wrote something that would basically take ebooks from Project Gutenberg, dice it into um, uh, files, actually base 64 it. So it's 133 times its original size and then throw it into tiny URL. Do you have, uh, the funny thing is the way tiny URL works is when you go to like tinyurl.com slash and a five digit hash, the, it returns a 302 redirect with whatever it was given. And let me tell you, at least back when I did it a year and a half, two years ago, when IE or Firefox gets 200K in the location header on a 302, bad things happen. Firefox locked and IE core dumped. And like I said, this was a year and a half ago. I don't know if it'll still do it, but I highly suggest checking it out. So length restrictions. Don't just validate data type, validate length too. Uh, also consider a whitelist plus a blacklist. You know, this is the classic, you know, my name is O'Brien and Every e-commerce site on the internet does not let me use my name uh, because they say, no, single tick, you can't have it. So you could say, I will allow you know, alphanumerics and a single tick, but no spaces. And anything that gets through, I'm going to go ahead and check it for SQL verbs. Um, you, you still have to be kind of dangerous here because you normally loosen your whitelist a little bit, and then you try to like solve it with a blacklist. So be careful. Sometimes this is a winning combination, but you got to do it right. And of course, PHP, ASP.NET, J2E, you know, faces, uh, struts, they have built in, you know, regexes. Some of them have built in validation frameworks like ASP.NET. Um, the J2EE landscape's kind of fragmented in terms of a really good validation framework. But, you know, a well-placed regex can stop this stuff, so use them. And I guess that's just about it. Question time. I'm sorry, could you say that again? Yeah. Hmm, I didn't know they had that. Oh. I'm, I am amazed. I'm still not sure what the question was. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, uh, we're having trouble actually hearing. I, I'm having trouble actually hearing the full thing. It's something about JavaScript. Can you come up and talk to us after the fact? Yeah. That would be good. All right, well, I, I guess we're done. Thanks a lot. All right.